So we started with our harmonic oscillator potential. Uh, which was given by H, H Hamiltonian T plus V, where this was P squared over 2M plus one half of KX squared, uh, which was P squared over 2M plus one half of M omega, uh, let's call it omega X because it's related to X, right? where well, this is uh, omega m omega square. And we have for that a potential which looks like this. And this is the harmonic oscillator potential which goes to infinity, which is not a good thing. So this is the potential as a function of r. If we move to the 3D potential, and as we say, uh, for this particular potential to you know each R. Uh, for each R, we are going to have a spherical symmetry because the potential will be the same. So this nucleus was uh, good to predict spherical shapes, right? So, uh, and so we prove ourselves that, for instance, in the case of oxygen 17, uh, we predicted nicely the. Uh, Phi half plus, right? The one half plus, uh, eight and nine, and the one half minus, which came from breaking apart in the P shell, right? So we have the P shell here, the zero P one half, and this was the zero odd particle or the odd neutron here, was in the, uh, in the zero D phi half, right? This was promoted here to the uh, one as one half, and we have this state here. This was the ground state. And by breaking a pair, we produce this guy. Here. So far, so good, right? So now I ask you, I ask you to explore at the uh, in the NDC uh, about all the nuclei. And so we could also predict the properties of nitrogen 15 also oxygen in 19 and other nuclei quite uh, remarkably. And uh, this added evidence to our shell model, our spherical shell model. Now, if you keep exploring, and I ask you to go through, uh, for instance, NEON 21, Neon 21, let's see what is the ground state with the uh, energy um, zero. And I have it uh, here somewhere in the PDF. There we go. Uh, I call it here. And then this is a three half plus, right? But let's see what happens when we build our shell model building, right? Let's see what happens when we do that. And let's do it here with a different color. Let's do it here with a different color. And we have four uh, protons and four neutrons. Uh, this is 10 and this is 11. So do we have these two and then these three here? these two and then these three here right so this will be magic number two eight and this will be 20. two eight and 20. and then we're going to uh add the 10 protons here one two one two three four and they couple with each other so to j equals zero and we have eight and then we have another two here and the same thing here, one, two, then one, two, uh, three, four, one, two, that's eight, nine, 11, and the odd particle comes here at 12, right? And we know 
that all these couples, they are all pair up to j equals zero according to the extra stability provided by the pairing interaction. So basically we only have this guy is our odd guy, right? Our odd, in this case, our odd neutron. And where, it, where is it lying? So obviously it's lying on, this is zero S one half. This is zero P three half, right? This is zero P one half. And this is guy here is zero D five half. So according to our picture, what should be this angular momentum here? So obviously D is uh, positive, D is two, right? L equal S, P, D, F, G, zero, one, two, three, and four, and so on and so forth. So what we have is that the, the particle, I mean, the, the odd particle will give neon 20, which is even odd, will give a ground state of five half plus, right? So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens if this is true or not. This is our prediction from the spherical shell model. And we see here that this is not the case. Actually, we measure experimentally, we measure that this guy is not five half, but is three half. And the five half come later at 350 kV. So again, let's look at the, our picture. And this is what we expect from the shell model. Uh, this is what the, the theory says. The experiments say that zero, this is a three half plus for 21 neon, we have seen, has been measured. So we always believe on this one, obviously. And there's a little bit of a, a gap and there's a five half plus there. This is the experiment. And this energy uh, is 350 or something KV, right? 350 KV, 351. All right. So uh, we go here. And this is our energy 351 KV. So obviously there's a clear uh, mismatch between what we predict theoretically and what the experimental value is. Right. So what is happening here is a, a, a feature of nuclei is that rarely, actually, nuclei are spherical. And in fact, they are more deformed. Right. And this is why we are missing the point here. So now let's try to explain the Nielsen model and we're going to go back to this particular issue later. So what we are going to do is to elongate this spherical shape and to make it, uh, to elongate basically to give a deformation to that harmonic oscillator potential by uh, doing the following. So we are going to have another Hamiltonian, which is going to be T plus V, which is again P squared over 2M plus uh, one half of K, which we know is M. And here we are going to, uh, to make a deformation, uh, deform the, the harmonic oscillator. And we're going to have a omega, uh, Let's say that omega x, let's make a, a elongation which looks like this. So basically this is x, this is y, and this is z. So we are, we are having what we call a quadruple deformation. Like a kind of rugby ball, which can be actually a, a rugby ball like this, 
or can be like a lentil. The lentil will be called an oblate shape and the rugby ball will be called a prolate shape. And we're going to go through this in a little bit. So then this Hamiltonian, as we're going to have the same uh, frequency because Y and X, they're going to be the same. So we are going to call this, uh, uh, let's call this X square plus Y square plus omega Z, Z square. This is going to be our new Hamiltonian where we have moved from the one half M omega, actually omega square here, uh, omega square here, omega square X square. We have moved to the, the uh, Hamiltonian, which, uh, you know, or R square here. We have moved from a spherical to the form shape, right? To a quadrupole deformed shape. Axially symmetric, axially uh, symmetric, which means that we have a symmetry of axis here. And basically, uh, this side here is the same as this side here. And uh, they are basically a mirror. We may have a triaxial shape, and basically, and basically, that x is equal to y. That's actually what it means. And we can have a triaxial shape, but we won't go into that, to that like uh, some of the galaxies look like, like two bumps on the side of one of those UFOs, right? So this will be a triaxial shape, but we won't, we won't study those right here. So we'll, uh, we'll focus on axially symmetric shapes. So this Hamiltonian, uh, will uh, will represent a uh, deformed uh, nucleus and to this Hamiltonian we have to add a couple of terms here which uh, they are related obviously to the ls and another term which is related to the l square so let's make it this uh, a clean one And let's investigate the situation. So basically, we have converted our Hamiltonian to p square over 2m plus one half of m uh, omega x square x plus y square plus omega z square z square uh, plus c. Ls, which is our spin orbit interaction, plus d L square. And this L square will make sure that because uh, this goes to infinity, it will make sure that for large L, the orbitals don't come to this positive side, which we know is repulsive. So basically, the L square will bring down these levels with uh, with large L, with L high, large L will bring this down so they don't get into the positive side, right? Of the potential. And so we have a potential, which actually these guys are done in such a way, basically, uh, normally this, there are two parameters and there's some change of variables. These are actually kappa and mu. This C is related to kappa in some books and this D to mu, but basically these are fitted, these are fitted to reproduce, reproduce the special case of a spherical deformation. Spherical shapes, basically, right? We fit those guys to reproduce what we know well you know, the, the zero S one half, the zero P three half, the zero P one half and so on and so forth, right? So this is for zero deformation. And that deformation, zero deformation, we'll call it beta. 
which is our quadruple parameter, the larger the beta, the larger will be the, the, uh, the elongation of uh, this uh, rigid rotor, of this uh, quadrupole shape. And uh, these guys will change as we change the formation. And they will change in such a way. Uh, here we go. They will change in such a way. As you can see here, this is our case. Without looking at these lines, and we're just looking at this vertical line, epsilon is assumed is the same as beta. Sometimes you call it beta, epsilon, delta. Depends on the change of variables from that C to, to kappa that we just mentioned before. But basically, they are the same, very similar from you know, epsilon, beta, delta. So, um, but basically what I want to say here is that this is zero S one half at the bottom. Then you have the P three half, the P one half. Then you have the D five half. Basically, if you look at this vertical line, it's the same thing as we have for the spherical nucleus, right? And this, this is how the Nielsen model is fitted, fitted to data. So we can reproduce these, uh, these magic numbers and this actually the level the levels predicted by the spherical shell model. So, uh, and then we are going to explore what this thing means. It looks complicated. So uh, this guy here in units of h bar omega is basically the, the oscillator strength, uh, which is given by I want to create a new one. I want to study what is happening, what comes out of this potential that we have here. Basically, it's that picture, that, that Nielsen diagram, which I just show, which basically has a, a, the formation here, which they call it epsilon, which we can call it beta or delta. Delta actually is the difference between the long and the, and the short uh, semi-axis ratios. Uh, this is difference between uh, X and Y, which are the same. And this guy here, which is the set. But these three parameters, you will see the Nielsen diagram represented in either of these forms, but it's always the same. And the energy or the single particles will be in units of H bar omega, where actually one H bar omega is 41 a to the uh, one third MeV. So this is the energy that uh, of the oscillator, oscillator frequency. Let me see. This is minus here. This is the oscillator frequency. So basically, what I'm saying that any line here, any line here will depend on the nucleus that we are investigating. Right, because these are in units of h bar omega, where h bar omega depends on the mass number. And remember, the mass number is this plus this. Right. So now let's focus here. Um, let's focus on this particular picture, which I just drew. And uh, we're going to make, a, as I say, a vertical line here, which corresponds to. Uh, to epsilon equal to zero. And if we move on to the right, we have uh, positive values, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, uh, minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.3, so on and so forth. These guys will look quadruple, uh, octuple, I mean, prolate like this. And these guys will look like this. So this will be our lentil shape will come on the left and this is, will be our prolate or our rugby shape this will be the the oblate shape and it will come on the right side of the Nielsen diagram so basically what we want to do is to explain 
a Nielsen diagram, which is quite uh, complicated when you see it, but uh, as you are going to uh, deduce, it's going to be very, very simple. And for this particular case, let's look if this represents this case. Actually, look at this one. Let's make this uh, D5 half. Let's make it D5 half. So this is one half, three half, and five halves. So let's make this particular example, which I just drew here. Uh, we have uh, basically like this. And this is the, uh, we call it the one D if I have, but we call it before the zero D if I have. This is for zero deformation. And then here we have uh, this fellow. Let's draw it, uh, look at it, at it again here. So the one coming down is the one half, three half, and five half. So, one coming down is one half uh, with three numbers here, three half with three numbers there and five half. This comes with a parity with, um, you know, if the, we have positive parity, we have a solid line. Ah, if we have a negative parity, we have a dashed line. The same will apply because D, as we know, is is uh, is equal to two. So obviously we have a, a a positive parity because the parity is minus one to the L. So basically we just we just drawing and we know S P D F G. So now in this particular case, in this particular case, we'll see. Uh, that all the levels, the P levels, they are all negative. I mean, negative parity, that's dash line because the P is equal to one. So the solid line for even uh, L or with the angular momentum, the F is also uh, three, the P is one, the G is four and so on and so forth, right? So you have a positive and negative parity. And uh, let's keep uh, adding to this picture. Each of these guys will be given three uh, quantum numbers, which will be n, n, z, um, lambda. So basically, the, the Nielsen quantum numbers will be given by n, which is our uh, harmonic oscillator quantum, quantum number that we know very well, n equal to zero, uh, one, two, it depends where you are in the harmonic oscillator, right? H bar omega, uh, n equal to one, n equal to two, and these are H bar omega, where again, H bar omega is given by this formula here. This is important to remember. So you see that now, you see the energies of these jumps, right? The energies of these jumps are characterized by this formula. So the energy, for say, for instance, uh, if we have uh, n equal to three, this will be two, four, I mean, eight, uh, 20, right? So the, this will tell us for, uh, they will tell us basically the energy gap between uh, this n equal to and n equal to three, for the uh, magic nucleus, which in this case will be 40 calcium, right? For magic number 20. So basically it will give us an idea of what is the energy, the, the separation energy, which is H bar omega, 41A, which is in this case 40, minus one to the three MeV. There is a way to deduce this formula, but it's not the scope of of this, uh, of this uh, class, basically, we have to match the harmonic oscillator with the square mean radius, but and this will give us this formula here. But this is uh, out of the scope from this course. 
So now we have the views that this is the n harmonic oscillator quantum number, n0, 1, 2. Then there's a, 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 a node number, which tell us a node, remember, if you have a, a potential, tell us how many crosses you have for your wave function. In this case, you have n set equal to one, right? If you have a wave function, which looks like this, n set is equal to zero, right? Basically, it tells you how many crosses you have with the, uh, with the horizontal here. Obviously, this one will come as, you know, with n, uh, this will be here. Everything should be an integer number of uh, wavelengths. This will be n set equal to two. Right. So this is the number of nodes. And finally, we have this guy here, which basically tells us is basically this plus minus one half. So basically it tells us whether the, 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 the spin is pointing up or down, right? Plus minus one half. And all these guys will be characterized by these numbers, n, n, z, and lambda. We don't need to know exactly, but what we need to know is that for this deformation, J, this is, a, is our J. As you increase the formation, J is not a good quantum number anymore. So we have to move to these quantum numbers, actually to these quantum numbers, which are called the Nilsson quantum numbers. So our purpose is to understand, understand this omega in this particular case. Uh, and so, although we have, uh, we know what these guys are, I leave you these guys to, to check if the guys make sense or not. So for instance, if we go to the D, to the D phi half, right? All these guys have uh, N, capital N2. Let's zoom this up here. Right, because they actually belong to the n equal to uh, quantum oscillator, right? Oscillator quantum number. As we all know very well, because we have the, uh, the zero S, right? The one P, zero, zero P, and the zero D, and the one S come together. This was n equal zero, n equal one, n equal two, right? This comes from the harmonic oscillator that we studied last week. So now the next question is to uh, understand why these lines go up and down in a way which uh, seems quite complicated. So again, we are moving from uh, the spherical shear model this is epsilon equal to zero or beta equal to zero. Let's call this beta, doesn't matter. And uh, this go up and this is again the energy uh, which is given in units of h bar omega where h bar omega is 41 to the a to the minus one third MeV, right? So this is an energy of a single particle which is equal to h bar omega. And for this particular case, we have that we have a D five half, the one uh, the one D five half here, and then we have a one half plus with some uh, Nilsson model uh, quantum numbers that we don't we don't care right now, and we have this guy which is the five half plus, and then we have this guy here which is a three half plus. Again, we see that these are characterized by these quantum numbers. And so obviously the first one is always going to be two here. And set and uh, this lambda, which basically characterized where the spin goes up, uh, lambda plus minus one half uh, is equal to this guy. Okay, 
So then this, fun enough, this goes, keep going all the way up. This guy comes all the way down. This guy going like this. And then this guy continues as being the five half. And this continues being the one half. This here is the three half. So this is epsilon uh, negative or beta positive, which again is a lentil, and this guy is a rugby ball. Okay, so far, so good, right? I mean, there's nothing strange. The only thing that we should uh, remember is that these guys, now we have divided, remember that the D5 half has six particles. So now we have that these guys only have two. All single uh, particle energies or single particle orbits in the Nielsen model, they have only two particles because remember the D5 half J, the occupancy, the occupancy was uh, 2J in the, in the spherical shell model. The occupancy was 2J plus one. So is J is phi half, obviously the occupancy of the D5 half is going to be six. And here we go, two, four, and six, right? So now this, where these particles lie, uh, it will depend on how, what is the deformation of this nucleus? Um, let's say 0 0.1, 0 0.2, this is 0 0.1 here. So basically, these particles will lie depending on what is the deformation of the nucleus. And for that, generally, I mean, you can have an idea by looking at the, at the, at the excitations of, uh, of the particular nuclei. But basically, you need to measure this, and you need to measure the quadruple moment. And this is one of the of the of the hot topics that we are we are doing in our group. Uh, we measure the quadruple moment. Basically, we measure the shapes, the quadruple shape of of the nucleus, right? Of the shapes of nuclei. Again. This is a, an amazing topic because remember that uh, the, the radius of a nucleus, right, is 1.2 a to the minus uh, the one third Fermi. So obviously uh, the radius of tantalon was a few, just a few Fermi, right? We reduce that ourselves, six, seven, eight Fermi, you know, such a tiny thing, eight, 10 to the minus 15 meters we are talking about, right? that we can deduce what is the shape, either a prolate shape or an oplate shape is quite amazing, quite remarkable. So the deformation is a, is a given that we can measure experimentally. And once we measure experimentally, we see what, uh, what happens. So we are going to do the same thing and we are going to do the same thing for the particular case of neon 21. So if we go now to neon 21, this is um, a paper which we're going to submit next week once we finish the, the lecturing, a paper led by your physics tutor, by Craig Mel, right? So this paper is manuscript will be submitted to uh, to physics letters B next week. And as you can see, this is a work done for many years, actually, where we are measuring, measuring the quadruple moment, which is uh, defined as Q in the laboratory frame. But this is a, a different subject that, uh, that I, I, I mean, this is by itself requires a master and a PhD to learn all these things. So, but basically we are determining the shape of the nucleus to be a uh, prolate with some kind of, uh, theoretically with some kind of a uh, little uh, clustering effects. And the quadruple moment um, is quite large. 
So we can see that the nucleus neon 20 is not spherical, right? This is the whole point I want to make here. Neon 20 is not spherical. And obviously, neon 21 uh, is likely not to, sphere, not to be spherical either. So now let's look at our Nissan model. And we calculated that our deformation is around 0.1 uh, five, something like this here, right? So then what we do is we make a, a, a vertical line. A vertical line on the deformation that we just measured, Craig Mel did, and say, okay, we have, this is the zero as one half, which we don't draw here. So we have two particles here. Then we count on twos, right? Four, six, eight, 10, see, uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, And here we have 12, 14. So, uh, we see two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. So let me see what happened here. Uh, do we count? So, we start counting on twos. Here is the eight, and here is the 10. Okay. So, as uh, you can see here now, we have a situation. Uh, let me see what was happening. in the N and the C. So the, uh, the data that we collected here, uh, it is actually here in the same plot. So we have that the ground state is at three half plus. Okay. And the, the next one is a five half plus. So, if we look at here, at our Nielsen diagram, we have uh, neon 21. So we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 11, right? This is the odd neutron, which lies on the three half plus, right? So let's do it here. So, Let's make it, uh, uh, actually, I know what to do to make it neatly. I was thinking on how to do this thing so it looks better. So uh, let me see, uh, LibreOffice. I'm going to open this fellow. LibreOffice draw, I'm going to open. Uh, desktop documents, this uh, particular Nielsen uh, diagram. Let's see, it opens up nicely. Okay, perfect. And then here, actually on this one, we can draw. I was wondering how to make it uh, neater for you. This is the deformation. And we say that we have calculated, we have determined experimentally a positive uh, epsilon of 0 0.15. And here we have, uh, we're going to draw, uh, let's draw one here, uh, one here. Actually, we can copy this one, control V. So we have two guys there, which they pair with each other, right? So then we count another two. Actually, let's, uh, let me copy this two. 
Uh, let me go with this twice. I want to move them up there. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Again, remember, we are drawing a vertical line on the deformation of interest. This is very important to remember, right? So this, uh, this deformation has to be, has to be uh, is a given. And you can see that all the particles are lying here and for neon 20, uh, Neon 21. Uh, let me do how do we I normally do this thing here? There's a text box somewhere. Yeah. So for 21 neon, we have a, a 10 protons and 11 neutrons, right? So we are counting one, two. This is in the uh, this is in the which is not given here, but this basically is what is the one as one half. The first, uh, the first state. And oops. here we go. We can make this smaller, as big as the other ones. All right. So and now. Uh, we see that we need an extra particle right there. So control C, control V. And now our particle lies right there. Neutrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, 11. 11 neutrons, right? So the odd particle lies right there on the three half plus because this is a positive uh, a positive uh, parity so this is exactly what we see in our uh what is our pdf here somewhere hidden in that place is what we see for the ground state of neon 20. Right, three half plus. And the next one is the excitation to the five half plus, uh, which is basically, if we are here, uh, I want to move that. Basically, uh, this is the particle that we were talking about. The extra particle, right? 11. As you can see, 11 neutrons for this particular deformation put the final odd particle on the three half plus. And if we promote this fellow here, we excite that fellow to the next one. This is the five half plus, right? Which is basically the next excitation right here. So ground state will be three half plus. First excitation will be five half plus. Um, you can see that right here. This guy was a ground state, but gets uh, the nucleus gets some energy, gets excited, and one particle goes up there, and you populate this first excitation with five half plus because it's a solid line, and that guy will eventually decay again to the three half plus, which is the ground state, right? And as you can see with this beautiful single picture, we have explained this, but there's one remaining thing, one remaining thing we want to understand. Why the one half comes down and the five half goes up, right? And this is a, a, another beautiful thing that we are going to explain and so we are going to finalize the the lecture series 
maybe we have one more to to revise on monday and some another tutorial but this is the final touch the final understanding is how these lines go up and down and you don't have a straight line like we have before and this is the reason for that so we have the again the uh, one d phi half and we have the phi half goes up and let's focus on the extreme case and the one half comes down and this is the case this continues this way and this comes down right this is the, the formation epsilon equal to zero and this is here uh, whatever 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 basically the the the, the, the more um, epsilon or beta the same thing uh beta deformation the more elongated the the shape will be right basically that's from going to 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 means that the more you are elongating the shape basically means that you also is given as a beta epsilon delta your elongation here is getting bigger and bigger right but let's clear this up because this is the final understanding that I want you to have. So let's see that the nucleus has a prolate shape, a rugby ball shape here. And let's put it here. That's our rugby ball. And uh, our rugby ball have obviously a nice rugby ball shape. Right, and um, we have a particle which we're going to have a symmetry axis here, which is our cell symmetry axis, which is a vertical line pointing up there. It's going to be Z. And this is our symmetry axis. So remember, now it's very important to remember what these guys actually mean. This is, if you have a nucleus, if you have a phi half, we already did this the other day. Basically, uh, this phi half, j is equal to phi half. So these are basically the mj's, the projections of uh, j onto the symmetry axis so we will have plus minus five half plus minus three half plus minus one half right so basically uh j five half will have the same j but the projection on the symmetry axis will be maximized so this will be j equal five half mj equal five half and the same thing we have the same down Pointing down, this guy here will be a particle orbiting around, moving this way, according to the to the to the right thumb rule, right? And we will have another particle which will orbit with the same j, but the projection here will be mj equal to three half. This is mj equal to phi half. And then this other particle will uh, should have make a different color. We have the same orbit, but obviously it will be going around this way, right? And then we have another color here for our, uh, let's put everything red. For the same j phi half all of them they have the same j phi half but it's now the projection what really matters this will be one half mj and this guy will come with a, a similar uh, rotation 
and going like this, right? There will be a particle. There will be another particle here. We will rotate in such a way. And these are for the positive uh, MJs. For the negative MJs, we have the same situation, but orbiting the other way around, right? So now all of them, they have the same J equal phi half. So now uh, that we know this, and uh, we know that this actually, these omegas are actually the projection of J onto the symmetry axis. And this was a, a very important piece of information. Now we see what happened with the phi half. Let's project this phi half over our shape here. So let's call it the, let's put this black color or let's make it different colors. We have all colors we can choose. But to be consistent, let's make it this guy, our J phi half. And let's make it like this, going around this particle, goes around our nucleus, right? So in this case, our nucleus, say, let's say it's 20 uh, neon which is the form, and this odd particle, the odd neutron, will give us the neon 21, right? So we have an odd neutron going around, and see what is happening here. Now, let's go to the, to the red, to the case where we have the the same orbit, the same j phi half in this case here we have the case of m j equal phi half sorry one half and let's not call it mj let's call it as in the new sum diagram equal one half and this guy is going to be equal to phi half So now, now I want you to, to look at, at this thing. So this guy, the one half is probably, uh, the, the, this trajectory to make it uh, more dramatic is probably closer here to the, to the nucleus, the same orbit. Let's imagine that this is the five half, the one half now, this red, uh, curve here because what I want to outline is the fact that the this fellow is always orbiting around this axis here so it's always farther away from the core so this is the core of the nucleus whereas the one half this guy here is going to over time is going to be closer to the nucleus, right? This guy orbits around the nucleus in a closer in a closer distance, right? This this guy is farther, on average, is farther, and this guy is much closer. So here is where the short range, and we go back to the beginning of the lectures of the nuclear force. is playing a role. As you can see, you know that the deeper we are in the potential, the more bind, the more binding energy we have. And this is precisely why the one half comes down and the five half goes up. Because the five half is orbiting around the nucleus farther away over time than the one half particle, which is going around the nucleus in a, a much closer, let me see if we can, much closer than the other guy. So let's make a new one here just with that picture. Let's see where we can make it. We can make a nice one. So we have 
the following nucleus. Let's make it this green. And we have this guy, which is our our rugby ball, our prolate shape. All right. Uh, is as you can see, it's quite elongated. And uh, this is our. And now we are going to uh, throw the five half, keeping in mind that the closer we are, obviously, the more bound we're going to be because of the short range of the nuclear force. The, if on average, you are farther away from the nucleus, obviously, because the, short, the nuclear force is short range, you're going to be less bound. And this is why the phi half for a particular prolate shape, the phi half goes uh, up, right? So let's look at it again. So we have the phi half particle, which goes like this, around the nucleus. And we have, this is the phi half. And then we have the other guy, which goes closer, much closer to the nucleus. Right. On average, the one half, right? So because of the short range uh, of the nuclear force, we have that the one half comes down and the five half goes up, right? For prolate shapes. So remember that in our potential, the deeper you are, the more bound you are, right? So this is positive, this is negative. Uh, so the deeper you are means that the, the short range is, is you're getting closer. As we see, we saw with the, with the helium, the range of the nuclear force for the helium four was when you have four, four, uh, four nucleons together. That was the range of the nuclear force. We approximated, but if you move away, the nuclear force weakens and doesn't play as a, as a big role, right? So this is why for a prolate shape, it will be, the, this is the case. And the opposite will happen if you move and you have here an oplate shape. In an oplate shape, uh, we have something uh, which look like a lentil here. A pancake, but in this particular case, now is the this guy actually that was like my here. This fellow, the five half, as we have changed the shape, this fellow is the one which is closer, the phi half, and the one half, which was here before, now is farther away from the core, right? And this is why in oblate, you will have that this guy is the one half to whatever it is, and this is zero deformation, epsilon equal to zero. This is negative for oblate, and this is positive for prolate shapes. So here we have our prolate shape, where the particle here is very clearly drawn. The phi half is closer to the core for oblate shape. That's why this phi half comes down and becomes more bound, right? So for a prolate shape, the five half is more bound than the one half, whereas for a prolate shape is the, the other way around. Okay.
And with this, I think we have all the information that I wanted you to learn for these uh, five weeks that we have been teaching. Okay, it was a, a pleasure. I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm going to open this session for questions. All right. So tell me guys, did you understand this final, uh, this final bombastic idea? It's clear, no? It's, it's basically depends on the projection. The closer you are, the more bound you're going to be. And the more binding in our, in our, in our diagram means that you go down, right? You get more bound, like the neutrons go down because they don't have any repulsion, right? Is that clear? So get so? Testing? But I just want to know, um, this only works if we know the shape of the nucleus, right? Right, Justin, very good question. This, uh, this works in such a way, but not only, not only because, uh, because uh, uh, as we saw, uh, actually, let me share again. Uh, the fact that we measure, precisely we need to know the, where to draw this vertical line. You are right. But, um, but I want to uh, tell you one thing. So the fact that we have a three half as ground state, and if we look at the Nielsen diagram here, and let's say, okay, let's move all these guys to the, uh, actually not these guys, I want to be like this, this, uh, how can I do that? This, 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 and this. Control X, actually no, Control V. I just want to move them here. All right, uh, I'm missing one, but let's see. Let's see, I assume that the, 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 the shape has changed. Uh, let me move this guy here. Let's assume that the shape is oblate. So uh, we move this to the vertical line somewhere minus point here. Okay. Let's do let's do let's draw our our Nielsen uh, model. Let's build, let's put our guys, our pair of particles. This come here in the first one. Uh, this guy comes there. This guy comes there. This guy comes here. Uh, these guys come here. I'm also modifying these fellows. I don't have to modify the shape of these guys. Okay, look at that one. Oops. All right, here. So basically, we are counting on twos, right? Twos. But we haven't measured the, the deformation. We just basically know that the, the, the ground state is uh, three half plus, and the uh, first excitation is five half plus. So if this is the case, look, in this particular case, these two guys are degenerate. So what we will expect is, okay, we may expect a three half, actually, let's move it. Uh, let's just, doesn't matter where we move it, but let's say, okay, let's move it. We can move it a little bit here to this side or to this side, but doesn't matter. So here, we, we, they could be, the ground state could be three half or one half, right? Because they are both degenerate. But this is, uh, this, is, this is okay. This is what we see here, right? However, it will be very difficult to explain the first excitation, right? The first excitation will imply that this guy, a first excitation with such a liter energy, right? It's only 350 kV. So you need energy. If you want to have this guy, this cool guy will be promoted there, but you need to break a pair, which will give you, will need more energy to do so. 
So in this particular case, it was clear. The odd particle was here, a jump there. You have the ground state three half, and now the next excitation is five half, right? In this case, you will expect to have a three half and a first excitation of one half very close to each other, right? Because these two guys are very close to each other. If this will be the deformation, this line will be the deformation. We can, we can move the line anywhere we want to. But even if we move it here, the same thing will happen, right? If we move the deformation of neon 20 to an oblate shape, a lentil shape right there, we can move all these particles there, but the odd particle will be lying on the one half, which comes down here, right? So you will expect a one half ground state, which is not the case. And you will expect a first excitation very close by being three half, right? So this is not the, 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 the case. So obviously, uh, is more likely that the deformation is actually uh, moving all the particles around within the nucleus, but we have to go back to the original. This other, other picture makes more sense, right? The one we drew at the beginning, and actually the one that Craig Mel has confirmed experimentally, that neon 20 is a quadruple, it's a quadruple deformation, uh, so how can we move this thing without moving anything else there? That doesn't matter. We did Assume the job prof. was done. Yep. Assume prof. Now, if we're moving to the left-hand side, we're still uh, putting in uh, uh, neutrons, not protons. Uh, right. So we, we are taking the, if we, whatever we move, whatever we move, remember that these two guys, for, for protons, we have 10, 10 protons in neutron. They will couple with each other, right? I was playing yesterday. They will couple with each other and they won't affect, they won't play any role. So, yeah. So basically it's the odd neutron, which is characterizing, but depends where this guy is. As I say, it makes more sense that this guy is here, right? Somewhere there, we don't know where, on the left or to the right but this has to be measured but independently this is clearly a three half and this particle may promote up there to a five half right which cannot happen if that particle is is uh, is here right in this case this particle the ground state whatever it is will be maybe a, a one half and the next one will be a three half or if this here will be a three half and the next one will be a one half, right? So this is not what we see experimentally. We have measured this experimentally and we see that this is the, the ground state is three half, but this first excitation being five half can only be explained because there's no five half, positive five half anywhere up there. You need to go very high energy to find another five half here, right? So this is not possible. It's clear, Justin? So I will have to give you the, what is the deformation, but if we look at the, at the NDC, we can deduce what kind of deformation, whether, whether it's prolate or is oblate according to the sequence of states. Okay, yes. Understand now. Any more questions? Chad, you everything is clear to you. Shoki, you are very quiet today. Songeso has already five points more for in his uh in his uh, participation for participating all the time. So you have the chance, whoever is here right now, to get extra points by saying something. Okay, five points for me, sir. <laughs> no, 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 don't just say something. Just ask a question. Ask. <laughs> don't be cheeky with me. So. <laughs> Thank you.
Salman Khan, you are doing very well also with assignments. And Craig is also doing very well. So guys, um, I'm going to leave one assignment here for you. So I'm going to share the screen. And I'm going to leave it here because I'm going to ask this question in the test on Friday. Do you want me to, to tell you or not? Please tell us, Prof. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you you are the you are the, the man today. Do you want me to tell you the question or not? Uh, are you going to put it on this coming test or the next one on Tuesday? I, got, I can put it anywhere, anywhere. So, but you want me to tell you which question or not? Yeah, please tell us, bro. <laughs> okay, so has earned this. So okay, I want to. I want to tell you uh, something very spectacular about nuclei that you're going to figure out yourself. So we are going to have this, uh, whatever, J uh, phi half, let's call it a phi half uh, H bar because everything is, uh, all the angular momentum is in units of H bar. And this guy is going to orbit assignment one. So it's going to orbit around, let's call it, a, for the time being, let's call it a, a spherical nucleus with radius R. Right, and you can uh, assume it's uh, one seven. Let's call it one seventy eight half new. So we have an odd particle, which is a particle orbiting around. Let's say that orbits around the surface or the nucleus. How many one seventy eight is? Uh, is uh, the form. But let's assume for the particle that it goes in an orbital motion with this radius r, and the radius is equal to 1.2 a to the one third Fermi for the time being. Okay, so to simplify the, the problem. So I want you to tell me what is the radial velocity? What is the radial velocity? Or the frequency? What is the radial uh, uh, velocity? or uh, frequency of the uh, nucleum orbiting around 178 half new, assuming, uh, assuming that you have a spherical shape, just to simplify things. Two. Now let's assume it's, it's deformed, actually, and uh, the moment of inertia of a uh, ellipsoid is actually one five. Uh, let me see this a and b. One five of m a square plus b square. But we are going to do the following trick. We are going to make it i equal. Imagine that a and b is the same, so we have the sphere two fifth of m r square, and we're going to uh, elongate it as we did with the Nielsen model. Uh, we're going to put here a three, um, let me see what is that, three, one, beta. And we're going to assume for this particular case that beta is equal to 0.3, okay? Beta is your deformation in the Nielsen model. So beta or epsilon, as I say, on delta, here at the beginning uh, is spherical and then you change to to positive basically prolate and oplate right so beta is positive 0 0.3 so we have an op a prolate shape this is the moment of inertia so i want to know if the nucleus is rotating on an angular momentum of 2 h bar so the nucleus has a is rotating like this so with a j uh, of equal to, okay, it's rotating like that around a circle. Obviously, we need to, it's going to, uh, oh, where is this here? Right. So 
if the beta deformation is three and the angular momentum is two h bar, what's uh, again the same question? What's the um, frequency of the whole nucleus? rotating okay so a special assignment and i want you to tell everyone to go through the video i'm not going to copy i'm not going to put this in the ikamba or nothing come and a special assignment which i'm going to ask these questions are you going to do them you have time to do them they will be in the test this uh, Friday, and always, always, I want you to interpret, right? Interpret. Uh, and understand this guy, separation, this term, separation between degrees of freedom. So interpret, but interpret in the sense of what is the separation between degrees of freedom. So you have you have a couple of days to prepare a beautiful interpretation to solve the problem, and then tell me what you what you see. And three. Three, I'm going to put it here. Uh, if Earth H, the life of the Earth is uh, 4.5 billion years, how many how many uh, rotations? has the earth made in its lifetime so i want you to tell me how many rotations has the earth done around itself around its own axis 24 hours every rotation right for its entire H, since the solar system was uh, was created, most of the of the, the sun, all the planets were created about the same time, 4.5 billion years ago. So, how many rotations has the Earth taken? And again, I want this interpret. All right, guys. With that, 